click on attendees. Uh -oh. and I see showed you, yes, because they're going to join, and that's right. what. Hi. Are you a member of our community? I don't know. Yes, I'm a member. Of You're welcome. Besides, just uh, come sit and sign in. Yeah. Happy to have you. So, uh, right. I'm going to promote Bridget and uh, you will be rejoining as a panelist. Oh, so nice to see you. Okay. And I will, own, I'm gonna promote Calvin. Hello, can you hear us? Yes, you are muted. Just tell me, is it, I have you and Calvin, is John Rappaport someone on your staff? No, it's just you and yeah. Calvin. Yep, me and Calvin. And how would you like us to address you? Uh, is it Ms. Brennan or is there an honorific that we should use? Uh, you could call me Ms. Brennan. I mean, frankly, most people call me Bridget. <laughs> we'll call you Bridget or we'll call you Baby Cakes. <laughs> it's fine too. <laughs> We're going to wait just a little bit before we start. I like to give people a little bit of time. Hi, Calvin. It's nice to see you, your face. We've talked on the phone several times. I'm just going to turn up my video for a second. I want to see if I should turn my overhead lights on. That's I'm fine. Dark, so I'm just going to be fine. out for a minute. Absolutely. Let me add that to me. Kylie is here. Look at her picture. Very neat. <laughs> I know. I, well, I'm, I told her I'm not a fan of that picture, but she's just that moment capture her to me. Um, we have a shortage at this date. It's a problem that we need to leave a few minutes after eight. That's fine. I'm hoping that we're done by eight. <laughs> Hi, Janine. I love the field of flowers and I like seeing you live. I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes. Uh, we actually have all of our attendees here except Ritu um, from our committee and those who are not here tonight. Sure. Yes. So, you know, Janine, it's so good to see you. Oh, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Nice to see you too. I had my uh, sound on. Oh, I'm off. I'm muted. Okay, good. I don't know where our volume is. Uh, okay. It's 6.33. I'll start at 6.34. How's that? Sounds good. 6.35. So are you planning to go to fire around or something? Yeah, I'm supposed to go there next week. Um, and then spend the month, but I'll go back and forth between there and Eastern Long Island because my mom was close to Far Island, but she can't do stairs anymore. So Santa, but yeah, yeah, I'll be there a bunch. Okay. I love it. Um, okay, so we're going to Um, okay, you know what? Half of this, I don't think we're going to have anyone joining us in the next minute or two that isn't already here. So I'm going to start. Welcome, everybody. This is the July meeting of the Human Services Committee of Manhattan Community Board 2. Uh, we have one agenda item tonight, and I will read it at it as it was printed. Uh, substance use in CB2. Guest Bridget Brennan of the District Attorney's Office of Special Narcotics shares with us the trends, developments, and strategies to address substance use in our district and our city. Um, I'm going to, we'll introduce ourselves and then we'll ask our guests to introduce themselves. And I don't know, Bridget, if I've actually even given your title correctly, so you can correct it when you introduce yeah. me. Um, I'm Susanna Aaron, I'm the chair of this board. Um, chair of this committee. Rather, chair of this committee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the chair of this board. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> no. oh. uh, never. Uh, Keith. I'm Keith Berger, I'm a member of the committee. Rachel? Chair Malinsky, I'm a public member of the committee. I'm Ryder Kessler, I'm a member of the committee. Zach Kazaz, also a member of the committee. Okay, let's get right into it. Um, why don't Calvin and Bridget, I'm sorry, and also I should point out that Janine Kiley, who's a member of our board and former chair of the board, uh, is with us. And we have two members of, two community members in the room. And I see two additional attendees uh, on the screen. Um, so why don't you guys introduce yourselves? and we'll get right into it. Sure, I'll start. I'm Bridget Brennan. I'm New York City Special Narcotics Prosecutor. 
I've been head of the agency for um, 25 years, actually, through many different crises in the city. I started as a Manhattan district attorney in 1983, and I handled uh, all kinds of cases there from homicides and sex crimes cases to uh, a wide variety of cases. Uh, our office is unique. It's, we're, it's actually unique in the country. We have jurisdiction over felony narcotics offenses throughout New York City. Uh, that is to say in all five boroughs. And by felony offenses, I mean the ones uh, where you can be sentenced to more than a year in prison. And by narcotics, I mean cocaine, heroin, fentanyl, opioid pills, but narcotics is actually narrowly defined. It does not include, for example, uh, methamphetamine or cannabis, unless that's found with a narcotic drug. We also prosecute related crimes. And you're not actually part of the DA's office, is that right? I think no. I... I'm appointed by the five elected DAs and our attorneys come from all five DA offices but we're not a part of that office. We work collaboratively with the five DAs throughout the city uh, and in particular in Manhattan because our jurisdiction in Manhattan is a little bit different. Since our grand jury sits here, uh, we have a bit more of an expansive jurisdiction here. But generally speaking, our grand jury only has jurisdiction over felony, certainly only over felonies. Uh, and only felony narcotics cases throughout the city. We tend to focus, and our mission is to focus on uh, cases of citywide impact. So cases that um, involve large criminal organization or for one reason or another, another have a significant city impact. Actually, Calvin had corrected me in an email that you're not part of the DA's office. Calvin, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you, I'm, I'm Calvin so I'm, um Director of Community Outreach with the Special Narcotics Prosecutor. Uh, and I attend um, meetings representing the office in Bridget, uh, precinct council meetings, community board meetings, tenant association meetings, block association meetings. And um, we also, uh, I also work with the police to sort of address quality of life issues that are brought to our attention at community meetings. Thank you. Um, um, let me just give us a run of show before we launch into it. The way we normally do this um, is we'll ask you uh, a couple of questions, and I know that you have some slides that you want to share with us. Uh, we'll go after at a certain point, we'll, or I'm, I may stop you with questions along the way. It's a very small group. Uh, our committee usually gets a uh, preference for asking questions, um, and then we will go to uh, the public. We have, uh, well, two members of our board are attending, and two other uh, community members are on the Zoom, and we have two community members here. So we'll We'll do that. And then after all of that, we will go into business session where everyone is invited to listen and, uh, and attend, but we will not take any comment from the public at that point. That will be a business session for our committee. Okay, so the reason that we wanted to talk to you is, uh, you're not surprised, um, we've seen a lot of uh, drug activity in our district, especially since COVID, uh, anecdotally. Um, particularly in Washington Square Park and all the areas that bleed around it, including the subway station at 6th Avenue and West 4th Street and side streets, um, Gay Street, Cornelia Street, Washington Place. I've never seen actual people shooting up before, and we have seen that a lot. Now the northwest corner of Washington Square Park has been an area of activity for quite a while. We know that during COVID, uh, Gail Brewer, who was the Manhattan Borough President at the time, uh, enlisted a group of social service organizations who already performed outreach in the district to coordinate their efforts to do outreach in the park. Um, that wasn't really well funded, so we were never able to get any data on whether that approach worked. Um, and uh, so that's it. So it would be helpful for us to understand what's going on, what are you seeing, um, and uh, we'll take it, and we'll take it from there. You, I, you may want to share your screen, Bridget. In which case, at the bottom of your screen, it should have a little green button that says "Share Screen." There it is. You don't keep. Yeah, I, I don't really understand who she works for, who appoints her. Do you? Who? Uh, who does appoint her, Bridget? Yeah, I'm appointed by the five elected DAs. So I'm appointed by uh, all of them, all the five DAs. Great. Okay. 
And I, um, it, the, the office was established by the state legislature to address the heroin epidemic, actually, the emergency uh, created by the heroin epidemic, with the hope that with a central prosecutor uh, operating under the, an agreement by the five DAs and answering to the five DAs, we might be able to better coordinate narcotics prosecutions in the city because narcotics tends to be a very stratified um, crime, stratified organizations where the drugs come in from the outside and then are distributed throughout the city. And so the goal uh, was to have the special narcotics prosecutor coordinate those efforts, focusing on the higher levels, uh, highest levels of activity and on the uh, narcotics organizations. And so that's kind of how the, uh, you, you know, the tasks are divided. The local- are you, uh, Do you answer to the mayor, to the governor? No, to the five DAs. Oh, okay. But the, office was, the office was created, the position was created by the state. The state legislature created the position, created the office, about 50 years ago, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary. And uh, I'm appointed by the five elected DAs and the attorneys who are assigned to our office each come from one of the DA's offices. Thank you for clarifying that. It's a yeah. little complicated and, and thanks for the question. Yeah, All of right. course. It's You're not like anything else, not like any of, there's nothing like it in the country because New York isn't like anything in the country where you have one big city divided into five counties. Uh, Janine, is there something you wanted to ask before we get? Yeah, down? yeah, just a high level question. You said there are certain things that you don't prosecute. Is that because of the way the legislation was initially written 50 years ago? Yes. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, the legislature, the um, office is specifically empowered to prosecute felony narcotics crimes in New York City. But the mission of the office is defined on, uh, as, you know, uh, crimes that have citywide impact. Okay, you can see your screen. Go ahead. You, may, you may want to make it bigger. My screen? Your screen, is screen. It, you aren't seeing the full screen? I. Mark, is it is, to make this bigger? Is that her job or mine? It's oh, I'll make it bigger. I know where to go. They just trained me on this. There you go. How about that? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's better. See, even I can do this. <laughs> okay. So, um, knowing that this was your interest, uh, what we did was look at the hot spots and then some other, um, tried to anticipate some of the questions you might have or some of the information that we could bring to your attention. So that's what uh, our presentation is going to focus on. So obviously some of the stuff you know, but I think it's important to look at it in perspective where things were in 2023, where we are now, uh, and, and try to see the trajectory uh, that the problem is taking. What we have seen in this area, and this has been consistent uh, really for a while, but it's getting worse, is that the concentration of drug sale arrests, now drug sales are felonies. Um, 220.39 is the charge. Uh, and if they're selling narcotic drugs, then it is something that potentially is within our jurisdiction. But generally, my office works with um, investigative organizations, uh, that is to say, NYPD Narcotics Division, or the DEA, Homeland Security, those kinds of organizations. We do sometimes work with uh, patrol if we have a game plan and a strategy that we're trying to advance. Often it's it may be at the request of the DA. Uh, but it's, that is not very common for us. Generally speaking, our work is investigative work. But here, and we're looking at this area to try to see uh, what the structure of drug dealing is here with the idea that if you can cut off you know, the supply of drugs, you're going to be able to reduce the drug usage, the money that's being made of it, uh, and, and hopefully, try to address some of the drug usage issues. 
but here right along the sixth avenue corridor this each green uh, red dot represents an arrest so you can see that the arrests are aligned right along there that was in 23 and you'll see uh, in the next slide it just gets worse in 24. now the, that was the arrest in all of 23. these are the rest for drug sales in this precinct from January to May of 24. So you can see they are making a more um, enhanced effort to address the drug sales. There are more sales arrests in this area. So far in 2024, there have been uh, 88 sales arrests and that compares to 62 uh, arrests in uh, all of 23. So they are trying to, the most of this, um, it, some of it is Manhattan South Narcotics, which is the uh, who, the people we would work with, generally speaking. Some could be patrol arrests, but in terms of drug sales, it's hard for patrol to make those cases. Usually they have to actually observe a sale in order to make the case. And to make a case that's going to really hold up in court, you have to have it generally on video if you're relying on an observation. So that can be pretty hard to do. But you can see where the concentration is. It's really in that uh, along Sixth Avenue and you can see there's multiple arrests, drug sales arrests um, off of Third Street with Third Street uh, between that and Manetta Lane and kind of in the uh, northern and, and western part of the park. Uh, Rita has a question. Sure, is it on that slide or is it just yeah. general? It's just... on both of them. Bridget, I'm just a little surprised that there haven't, hasn't been more arrest activity around the meatpacking district. Um, is well, it's cut off from your map or? Yes, it is cut off. I mean, this is a map of the sixth precinct. Oh, um, it. it doesn't, you know, that's a different precinct. And I didn't do that kind of, I, we did some analysis of other precincts uh, within the district, but my understanding that it was that your concern was in this particular area. So that's what this, these slides are focused on. Uh, uh, so it doesn't cover the meatpacking, sorry. Sorry, Bridget, the meatpacking is in the sixth district and I was just, you know, oh, you mean over on 13th Street in that area over there? Yeah, and uh, Greenwich yeah. and Washington well, Streets. Uh, do you know what this is? This these are where the arrests have been. Okay. Now I don't direct the arrests. This is data that we've analyzed from the police department. These generally are probably not our cases. Our office did do some work uh, in this area in February. We were focusing on the Washington Square Park area, and we made several arrests in that area. Uh, but generally speaking, we don't handle the cases that come out of this area, so I can't really speak to what's uh, going on. We do some work further north. Uh, I've never, I haven't had any. Uh, that would it just goes along the lines of a little bit of um, economic inequity and. Um, racial inequity to see it you know I, around I, Washington really Square as opposed to something yeah I don't I'm surprised the arrests when they come in and we don't direct the arrest this if we're doing an investigative case if we're building a case um then we would follow the case where it goes but this doesn't really represent any investigation so I can't really reflect on the choices that are made. My guess is they get a lot of complaints about drug yeah. dealing in that area and they're responsive to those complaints, is my guess. Question on this map too, the long blue things, does that mean multiple arrests? When those you see- dots. What? There's... Those are all dots. Yeah. Oh, it's so it does look, I see two things that aren't dots. I think if it looks like a lozenge, it's a comp it's a it's yeah. little dots yeah. together. Yes, little it's dots. multiple arrests, and it could be you know it could be multiple arrests at the same time, or it could be multiple arrests at a site where there's frequent dealing and there's um, been oh during that period of time there's been repeated arrests. 
And, you know, it could happen, too, that the same person who was arrested one time could be arrested uh, multiple times, actually, in the same location. I've seen that happen in different areas of the city. Okay. Thank okay. you. And feel free to ask any questions. I'll, I'll certainly be happy to answer to the, my, the best of my ability. All right. These are the misdemeanor drug possession arrests in the sixth precinct. Um, so as, as you can see now, the misdemeanors as for possession of drugs, and that would probably be very open possession of drugs. These would all be patrol arrests. Uh, and so you can see that this covers a much larger area, even though there's still a concentration in and around um, the Sixth Avenue area, uh, kind of a little bit north of Washington Square Park, a little bit in the park. But these, this is um, from 2023, where those misdemeanor possession arrests were. Jake, can I ask a quick go back to that? So let me go back to that one. Now I'm going to show you 2024. Go ahead. Um, sorry for my lack of knowledge here. What, what qualifies as a misdemeanor drug possession? Um, a like is it a quantity or how does that get categorized? Yeah. The, the difference between a misdemeanor drug possession and a felony drug possession is the weight of the drugs. Um, if it's for basically the amounts that are for personal use uh, would be a misdemeanor. And when there are more significant weights, the law has different um, gradations and different weights uh, that are, um, it, it might be a D level offense if it's X amount of weight, a B level offense if it's more an A1, if it's a really substantial amount so the law kind of um, apportions penalty depending on how much substance you have. The concept being that the greater amount of substance you have, the more likely that you're um, selling the drugs. And the more, if you have large amounts, then you're very likely a more major player, a more major dealer. So your exposure is greater. Is that irrespective of the type of drug? No, it's not. Narcotics drugs, the ones that I defined before, have more significant penalties attached uh, because they're more deadly than the, um, the rest of the drugs are called controlled substances. Got and it. all the, you know, narcotic drugs is a subset of controlled substances. And so the penalties are greater for narcotic drugs than they are for controlled substances. Uh, cannabis or marijuana, it generally isn't illegal anymore, but when it was, it had its own section of the law. It was not either a controlled substance or a narcotic drug. It was just weed. Um, thanks, by the way. As we go along, we're sharing, I mean, we're, we have obviously a lot of elemental questions because this is pretty new to us. So thanks for your patience. And well, I'm happy to answer the elemental ones. Those are the ones that are easier for me to answer. Okay, so, so go on. Okay, so you could see, you know, th this is the pattern of arrests in 2023. And this is what it looks looked like uh, from January to May of 2024. Let me just shift back and forth. 2023, January to May of 2024. So it doesn't look that much yeah. different, although that reflects just the first half of the year. So uh, my, you know, my observation is simply that they appear to be concentrating uh, more resources in, in those arrests in that area uh, than they did the prior year. Um, and again, you don't see much of a difference in the concentration. I'm going to flip back and forth again. The concentration of arrests, really, the pattern hasn't changed very much. Right. Okay. Yeah. Those are the misdemeanors. Again, misdemeanor arrests, we don't have any jurisdiction over those. Those yeah. are prosecuted by the DA or, or handled by the DA in whatever manner the, the DA handles those. Okay. Now, this is interesting um, comparing the specific drugs detected in the six precinct arrest, comparing 2023 to 20, uh, you know, the first six months of 24. And it really is um, 
pretty different. You don't Can you see usually... that? I can't really see it. Yeah. Can you yeah. just tell us what the, I, I, I'm too familiar. The orange one is fentanyl. And uh, fentanyl. The orange one is fentanyl. And the blue one is cocaine. Huh. The gray one is pharmaceutical drugs. They're actual pharmaceuticals like ox, uh, oxycodone or one of those drugs. Um, and the royal blue? The royal blue is cocaine. Uh, okay. That li the little sliver of blue is, um, I'm not sure what that is. It could be no controlled substance indicated. I think that's what that acronym stands for. It was, LSD, light blue is cocaine, the big one. The light blue is cocaine, yeah. the large light blue is cocaine. Okay, uh, you know what, you're gonna, I'm gonna see this again afterwards, so I, uh, yeah. But I've just- and, and so you also have some of the hallucinogens in 2023. Um, you know, there were some cannabis seeds there, some MDMA. The difference that you see between 2023, 2024 is actually quite a significant difference. Yeah. Um, in the amount of fentanyl that's being seized, the percentage of fentanyl and cocaine, cocaine has increased too, and it's nudging out the other substances. Wow. Obviously, both of those drugs have a quite a profound effect. 80% uh, of the overdose deaths in New York City are related to fentanyl. And cocaine, we're seeing a lot more cocaine coming in now. Uh, Columbia is producing a lot more coca plant. And so, you know, the results as we see more here. But again, the behaviors associated with cocaine are, um, you know, they're manic and they're more profound than with some of the other substances. So, so you're seeing a shift over in the drugs that we're actually seizing. This comes from the police lab reports. Bridget, is that, sorry, just a quick, I mean, this might be a pharmacology question. Is the reason that fentanyl is growing so much is because it's being mixed into other narcotics and so it's showing up in that category? Yes, fentanyl is, in uh, so many of the drugs that we seize now. Uh, we seize it with cocaine, we seize it with everything. Uh, and so that certainly is a big part of the picture, but we're also just seizing more fentanyl. Fentanyl is a synthetic drug, it's 100% chemicals, much cheaper than the organic drugs like heroin. You don't see heroin even on this chart. Uh, <laughs> And uh, cocaine is another organic drug because it comes from a plant. It has to be uh, harvested and refined and it's coming from Colombia or Central America. It's actually a much more expensive uh, product. And so you're just seeing fentanyl. Uh, we, we see a very large amount of fentanyl now. It's a profound wow. effect both on our overdose death rates and just on the drug market itself. Any more questions on this slide? Should I go to the next one? Well, keep going. Okay. So this is the overdose summary. Um, the uh, non-fatals are represented in the sort of teal color, the blue line. And the fatals wow. represented by the orange line. And so 22, 23, and the first six months of 24. The Information on 24 is from um, suspected overdoses. Those are preliminary results from the OCME. The final results are very delayed by our city health department. They don't actually come out until about a year after um, afterwards. And so we try to get more current information by working with the OCME. We can't give specific numbers because they aren't finalized yet, but we find that they tend to be kind of close to uh, to what actually has happened. And so- uh, well, We're seeing, what I take away from this is that there are so far this year, there are as many deaths as there were in all of 2022. Yes, and, um, and more than in uh, 2023. And right. part of what's remarkable about that is across the city, I think many places we're going to be seeing, certainly in 20, uh, 24, I think we're going to be seeing something of a decline in deaths. 2023, we saw in some of the precincts a slight decline in deaths, just as you see in the sixth precinct between 22 and 23, there was a slight decline. Uh, some of that is carry, 
carrying over in some of the precincts in 24, but it doesn't look like the sixth precinct is going to be in that same category if this trend holds. Okay, so these are where the fatal overdoses were in the sixth precinct in um, that's January to October 23. Again, as I told you, this is based on ME data or the final uh, health department reports and they come out, that's very delayed reporting. So, um, so anyway, it shows you the kind of um, disparate location where you actually have the fatal overdoses. No, there's no real cluster. I'll, I'll tell you one reason why we look at this is when we're um, asked to you know, step into an area, one of the first things we look at is where are the overdoses. If we see a cluster, especially of public overdoses in a certain location, it's an indicator to us that there are drug dealers right in that area that are obviously selling product that people are using. And if they're using it publicly, they're often buying very nearby. And um, we concentrate efforts in those areas where there's a concentration of deaths in order to cut down on the number of overdoses. So this uh, display from 2023 doesn't indicate any particular pattern. I mean, certainly, you know, it's in and around the Washington Square Park area, um, but there are others, uh, as was pointed out, in, in different parts of the precinct. Okay, and this is the fatals. There's only been four fatals from January to October. This is, says 23, but I, yeah, January to October 23. So, um, you know, it's uh, doesn't, again, no pattern, no particular pattern. Um, I do think, and this is something I'm gonna show you in the next slide, that some of the lack of fatals is attributable to the um, use of Narcan in oh. I think my guess is that it's been widely distributed. People are widely trained on how to use it and it is being used and it's saving lives. One of the reasons this is a hard slide to interpret for you, so I'm just gonna walk you through it. Um, this is OD Map is a service that's operated by the Washington Baltimore HIDA. And um, they analyze data from uh, around the country to help us determine not just overdoses, non-fatal overdoses, fatal overdoses, which ones had naloxone uh, treatment, which one didn't, which ones um, had multiple naloxone uses. And this health all uh, when you're trying to design um, you know, drug enforcement strategy to know that. And what we see here is both the light green the lighter green and the purple are non-fatal overdoses where there was naloxone used to revive oh. the person. Oh. There's only one blue, uh, which is a non-fatal with no naloxone. <laughs> All the rest of these light greens are single dose of naloxone and the purples are multiple naloxone doses. Um, and that's the analysis from 2023 via this service that I just referred to. And I think that's something that's probably helpful for you to know too, as you're looking at your community, that there really is a lot of engagement and a lot of use of uh, naloxone or Narcan, whatever you wanna call it, uh, that seems to be saving quite a number of lives. Yeah, it's hard for us to, to, to do, to conclude that all of these would have been fatal without the Narcan, but we could probably assume that a bunch of them would have been, and uh, that's a lot of tragedy averted. Yeah, I mean, you know, you never know, but what you do know right. is that the person uh, did survive. And God, no. that's a good thing. Yeah. And Bridget, do we know who administered that's this funny. Narcan? Like, is this EMTs, cops? Like, how is this getting recorded in the system? It's recorded in many different ways to OD map. And um, this, the, the information that we get back 
does not distinguish. I've never seen anything distinguish um, who's, you know, um, who's, who's using. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, what I was trying to see is the, what the map is. It's at Northern Bar Boundary 14th Street. Well, I mean, we only did the precinct, so. The northern boundary of the clusters. Yeah. 14th Street. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and this is the last one is Houston. Yeah, I think it's whatever the sixth precinct. It's the sixth precinct yeah. map. Some and others. sometimes when we're imposing it on somebody else's mapping system, it doesn't, you know, our boundaries don't exactly conform to their systems. So, no problem. Uh, but I think it, I thought it was information that is, helpful for you to see as you're thinking yeah. about, you know, your particular issues. It's kind of low. It's interesting how that's different than the arrest mapping. Yeah. Do you have more that you yeah. wanted to share with us? Sorry? Do you have more slides that you wanted no, to share with us? That's all I, that's yeah. all I wanted to share with you. Right. And I'm happy to answer questions or... So I'm going to start with one. Um, one of the questions we always have is about harm reduction centers. Uh, we know that there are two of them in the city and we have, I have a long-term plan to go do a, a field trip up there, but I have not yet done it. Uh, the question with a harm reduction program is always what kind of impact does it have on a neighborhood where the center closes at a certain hour, people can use in the center, but obviously they need to purchase their drugs somewhere else. Um, what kind of activity have you seen, just anecdotally, in East Harlem uh, near, there's one on East 118th, I think, and one on West. It's on, uh, Kelvin, is it 126? 126 between Lex and Park. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, I think the Harlem community, many, People in the community have been quite vocal about what they find there. Um, we've had a lot of complaints about open drug selling in the vicinity. Uh, and right across from that, there is, well, number one, right across the street, there's a, a daycare center. Um, and we've had complaints with respect to the daycare center because people obviously don't just uh, everybody who buys in the area would, attracts drug dealers. And so everybody who buys doesn't just go in and use. They go to, they use on the street. They go to the subway, big subway station that's right across the street and go down there and use. We get a lot of complaints about that. Marcus Garvey Park isn't far from there. We get a lot of complaints about drug usage there. And one of the things I will tell you is that the overdose deaths in the 2-5 precinct. It's in the 2-5 precinct, but the precinct is obviously much larger than that, but the, they have increased. Um, but the 2-5 is a complex precinct. Um, and so obviously there's not just one thing, but we have heard that in that area. Calvin, you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, and also um, unfortunately where the um, safe injection site is right around the corner is a methadone, a methadone clinic. Um, literally a half a block, a half a block away. So it really compounds the problem in that area. Yeah, I think, and what you do hear that the Harlem community complaining about in that area is the concentration of services, that they have many methadone clinics uh, and other services right in that same area. And there's a bus that comes right from Wards Island, the shelter there, right, right and drops off right on 125th Street. So. Exactly that le lends to a pretty chaotic situation there. And, um, but we do hear a lot of, uh, it, you know, th there, there may be people who, if they're gonna complain, they're gonna complain to me and Calvin probably. Uh, and so, uh, but we, and I've taken a ride past there many, many times to try to uh, see what effect it has on the neighborhood. And that's in the Harlem community. Now, the one that's further uptown in Washington Heights, is in a, a different uh, area. I have heard, I, I haven't heard the specific community complaints from in that area as much. I don't know, Kelvin, if you have. I think the biggest complaint is from the school, which is two blocks away. Uh, and the, the faculty there have been complaining about the parents 
taking their children back and forth to school and observing some of the issues over there near the state injection site in that area. You don't have the, the type of community organizations there as you do in the 2-5 precinct. And I think that's one of the reasons why you don't verbally hear the complaints like you do in East Harlem. Yeah, I did check with the precinct too to see what kind of, um, you know, the impact. And I did hear from the precinct that they have seen a, a concentration of drug usage, not obviously not in the supervised injection site itself, but it, around the area. And there is a school, there's a playground right across the street. And there's a school not far away where a lot of people, and again, they're scaffolding, you know, like we have all over the city, they're scaffolding outside the school. So they do send a, uh, a car to clear out people who have come there overnight uh, to use drugs, who've gathered, you know, to buy drugs at the location that's nearby. And then they, um, outside of the um, supervised injection site, and then they go to uh, the scaffolded area outside the school and not out or, you know, sleep or, or whatever. And the uh, precinct does generally send a car <clears throat> before school every morning to clear that out before the children start coming to school. It's a very large school. So I have a question about drug sales. Uh, you know, you see, we see these arrests and we have no idea, you know, if that's like a bag of something or, you know, if that's a, a small street guy, but obviously the interest we always have is the kingpins, right? Where is this all coming from and how do you cut it off at the top? And I'm guessing that that is really the main of your, the focus of your work. Um, yeah. How do you, what are you learning? What are you seeing? Where are you, where are you prosecuting? What, what is going on with that? Because I'm well, gonna guess people who are selling in Washington Square Park and they're, by, and they're near there, they're getting it from somewhere else. Yes. They are. Um, what we see with respect to fentanyl is the fentanyl is being produced mainly in Mexico. The chemicals for it are coming from China. It's produced, it's trucked across the Southwest border. Um, I, and in, in, it can be concealed in a car too, but it's mainly some kind of motorized transport, uh, a car or a truck with very large loads. We see them coming cross country. They may make drop-offs at different cities as they cross the US. Ending up, we see most of the concentration, the heavy loads coming in into the Bronx. Um, it's geographical, plus it has a whole lot of highways cutting through it. But if you recall that terrible situation uh, with the ch children in the daycare center last summer, that was up in the Bronx. Oh and yes. Ultimately, if you recall, they found kilos in what we call a trap, a hidden compartment under the floor where the children were taking their naps. Uh, and so that kind of a scenario where they, um, the fentanyl is offloaded somewhere in a warehouse or whatever uh, in the Bronx and then transported to another location to either be bagged up or to be redistributed to smaller groups throughout, uh, throughout the New York area or throughout the whole region. I mean, the stuff from New York goes to Pennsylvania, goes to Maryland, goes all over the place. Uh, and so that's where, that the Bronx is where we tend to see the large loads coming in and then being distributed to them. The other thing uh, that we should all be very aware of is the market for, um, the social media market for drugs. That especially pills, we see fake pills, counterfeit pills, that have the imprint of oxycodone, Adderall, you name it. And they're very good imprints. They're very good counterfeits. They're all over social media. They're being, and it's not just so, social media, they're being sold on the street. Uh, and those pills are very likely to contain fentanyl. We've seen it um, happen across the city. We've had ourselves some, we've uh, intercepted, you know, tens of thousands of pills. Um, hundreds of thousands of pills out in one location. And so that we see going on a lot. My office is trying to, uh, is reaching out to the schools quite a bit now. After there was a um, student, a freshman student, freshman girl who died last November. Um, she was a student at Brooklyn Tech and she died after ingesting fentanyl. 
And yeah. so we've been going out to the schools to do a lot of education and, and prevention, just telling them what's out there. Uh, and you just can't trust anything in the drug supply now. Uh, and especially the pills though. They look like counterfeits. I mean, they don't look like counterfeits. They look like the real thing. You really can't tell the difference. Um, and uh, so that is a huge issue. I can't say that I have seen it in in any of the cases that have come out of your uh, of the six, but it, it wouldn't show up that way. Um, it shows up differently. You do that kind of investigation. You actually often do after there's been a death, and then you backtrack it to try to find out where the drug, drugs came from. Every two. So my question is, Bridget, do you guys track the correlation between um, drug arrests and criminal activity as well, uh, other criminal activity? Could you say that again? Do we track drug, okay. arrests? Here, 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 drug here. arrests, drug usage, drug arrests with um, other criminal arrests, criminal activity? So well, is there, there a correlation between you know, hot spots of drug usage and other um, crime, serious crime. Yeah, I, I mean, what you tend to see in the kind of, in, in the pattern that we look at in the six, and you, we see this up in the 25th precinct, sometimes in the 28th, you see a lot of um, shoplifting, grand larcenies, you know, the fentanyl, if somebody's addicted to fentanyl, it goes through the body very quickly. That's why it's so deadly too. And people are using multiple times a day and, you know, they don't have any job or they don't have money to pay for the drugs and they're not going to get it for free. And so we see a lot of thefts in those areas where you see a concentration of low level drug dealing. Um, and you see, and my guess is you're seeing it in this, in your area, uh, in that particular area, you know, the, um, the packages being stole, the Amazon deliveries being stole, all that kind of low levels, uh, low level thefts. You see car thefts, car break-ins, all that kind of stuff, home break-ins, burglaries. We see that kind of correlation very commonly, um, with areas that have high drug usage. Kelly, you want to add anything to that? No, yeah, I think you pretty much covered it. I, I, uh, as you mentioned, the shoplifting is a big issue. Um, we see that on the 125th Street corridor, uh, and we, we're seeing it in, in the 6th Precinct also. Um, and I think that's the number one issue when it's tied into the, the drug use and, and, and street-level drug use in the, in the community. There's also supposed to be a new combination now that is becoming much more prevalent, which is um, fentanyl mixed with uh, what's called trank. Yeah. I, I, I think that in the city. Yeah. Trank is actually the, the name for it is xylazine. And it is an animal tranquilizer, which has is not approved for human use. Um, and we are seeing it in the city. I looked to see whether I, I didn't see it in any of the drug labs that came back from the six precinct cases that we looked at, but we see it in, in surrounding areas. We've seen it in other places in the city. Um, it is- Much more lethal. It, it's, it's a sedative and fentanyl is an opiate, but they both have a sedating effect on the body. And so that combination is more lethal and xylazine is not responsive to Narcan. Narcan only works on opioids. Right. And so that combination is you yes. know, quite lethal. And in addition, uh, xylazine can be addictive as well. And it also causes abscesses, skin abscesses. So someone who chronically uses xylazine will have, you'll see in, in, in areas you probably, you may have even seen it, open wounds. Uh, some people lose limbs because it, you know they, they've had uh, such bad infections. So it's a terrible drug. It's horrible. Uh, but we are seeing it in the drug supply. There's a lot. It, I saw it start in Philadelphia. They still have a lot of it there, but we've seen it throughout the area. There's, you know, you don't want to hear my bad news because there's more and more of it. But there's oh, right. another um, there's another animal tranquilizer that we're starting to see mixed into drugs. Again, most of it is just about the economics of it. 
Xylazine is easy to get. It's another white powder. Uh, you can try to distinguish your product from somebody else's. There's another animal tranquilizer that we are seeing being mixed in now, not in great quantities. We haven't seen it like uh, xylazine yet, but we're seeing it. Scott Ryder. Yeah. Thanks. Um, this is really helpful. Sorry, I just started coughing as I started talking. Um, I have I have a bunch of questions. I, I'm going to start with two. One is quite specific and narrow, and one is a bit more general. The specific one, you talked about the availability of naloxone as helpful for reducing the likelihood of fatal overdoses. And you know, as a board, we think about what can we do to help advocate for better outcomes. You know, we can be a good kind of forum for learning, but we also have a voice. I was reading just yesterday, there was an article about a program designed to provide vending machines to communities that included things like COVID tests, but also naloxone kits. There were supposed to be 10 of those machines. Four have been rolled out and they've distributed 2,100 naloxone kits, but the rest of the six have not been. And the program was shuttered because of a lack of uh, organizations that wanted to partner to host those machines. So I guess like, would it, do you think we as a board should be advocating to get a vending machine like that or some naloxone kit provision in our community district, would that be a helpful thing for our board to do? I, I mean, I, I don't actually know if you need a mach vending machine. What, what I would suggest is you just get do naloxone training. And normally when you do that, they distribute naloxone to the group that's being trained. And just to give you an example, my office has had naloxone training and um, three days, maybe within a week after one of our trainings, we had we play softball and we had a softball game in Tompkins Square Park, which is an interesting experience. In <laughs> uh, but one of the one of our players on her way to the bar after playing softball saw a woman collapse on the street who she believed, be, based on her training, had overdosed. She saw somebody who was trying to give her naloxone but wasn't using it properly. She had her naloxone. She had just gotten it from the, our investigators distributed it to everybody who took the training. She had just gotten it that, that morning from the investigator. She was able to uh, use it properly and revive the woman. You know, and so it, it that's how um, I think naloxone is most effective the more people who are trained to use it and who are carrying it, when they run into that incident, when somebody is in, in need, uh, they're able to use it. And, and the good thing about naloxone is there's absolutely no negative impact on the body if you're not overdosing. It simply removes um, the opioids from the opioid retain receivers in the brain. Uh, and so it just frees up the brain. The only thing, uh, you will find sometimes is that the person, the person who has been um, overdosing, if they do have a substantial habit, will immediately go into withdrawal because it just rips those um, opioids off the opioids receptors. So they yeah. and so they can be a bit combative and uncomfortable, and and people need need to be trained about what to do about that too. But but that is what those are the things that I might encourage. Yeah. Because again, the more people who have it and can use it, uh, unfortunately, there there may be opportunities to do that. that that's helpful. I, I think like we could undertake that training, but we could also be a hub to encourage local businesses and institutions to do it with their staff. Um, yeah. But that is a segue into my bigger picture question, which is you know looking at the data of the arrests and the trends over time and the and the overdose trends as well. It, my read of it, my interpretation is that an in increases in arrests doesn't translate into reductions of use. There is there are a lot of arrests happening, but overdoses are also going up. I guess I, I wonder like, what can we do, not us as a board, but us as a city, um, beyond simply you know increasing policing and prosecution because that alone doesn't seem to be translating into reduced you know drug sales and activity mm -hmm. in our district. I mean, I mean, the the one thing I will say, we have worked in the Times Square area um, on uh, reducing the number of people selling there, 
And we have seen a reduction in, in the number of deaths in that area. So there can be a correlation, if, especially if you have a lot of drug dealing going on and you have a very public drug use. But there are actually, there are four different um, ways that are recognized to reduce uh, overdose deaths and drug usage. One is supply control, you know, which is law enforcement. One is harm reduction, Narcan, um, supervised injection sites, that kind of thing. But the two others, I think, are terribly neglected now. One is treatment. And if you look at the number of people actually going into treatment, you can get that information. And this will just be the people who are uh, getting Medicaid-assisted treatment. But the state keeps those records. The number of people going into treatment is declining, has declined. And we all see with our own eyes that the number of people who are suffering from substance use disorder is increasing. Uh, and so we need to figure out how to maximize that. And the other tool is prevention, which is what we haven't seen. At my office um, really has been trying to get out there, not with a scared straight, you know, do this and you're gonna die and all that kind of stuff, but just get information out to people so they know what's in the drug supply, they know the risks they're taking, particularly children and start it young. Um, and so my office has really tried to take on some of that mantle. We're working with DOE now, we just got a, a lot more outreach from DOE to do that kind of stuff, but that needs to be done all over. It's not, schools are really important, but um, my guess is in the senior centers, they could use at least um, information about that. Many of them are caretakers too. So, so there are other things we can do. There's actually four things that are recognized. And um, I, I believe that we have overemphasized perhaps two. I'd like to see us overemphasize the other two. That's a perfect segue to my next question. And then I, I really will let other people ask questions because, you know, I think in our district, we've seen an over-reliance on supply control because I don't think we have done, you know, we're not a hub of harm reduction. But uh, the treatment piece, it really interests me because one of our council members who covers our district is Eric Botcher, and he just sent a letter to the mayor in the last few days asking for the Be Heard program to be rolled out in this area. Um, I was reading about this in his letter and the coverage of it that suggested 42% of the people who are come into contact with Be Heard get connected to treatment services for their issues. Do you, is that the kind of program that you see as working? Is it not at all tracked up to be? Does it need more resources? Is that the kind of thing that we as a board should advocate for, you know, to be introduced in our community district? I'm not specifically familiar with that program. Got it. Um, it you know, the hard part is as any of you who've worked in this area probably know, is interesting people in going into treatment. I mean, yeah. you know, what, once you're there is very tough um, and, and you need repetitive uh, reach out. It, it can't just be once and then that's it. Now, going way back and it's still today, when somebody's been charged with a narcotic crime and we believe that their uh, their crime is really motivated by their drug use, we do offer alternative um, sentences. Sometimes it is alternative to incarceration. And there are people who have said that that's the only reason they ever got into the program. Once they get it in and they stay in for a while, it's more self-sustaining, but the, getting over that hump is really tough. And so I think that's what we all struggle with is how to get how to get people over that hump because they don't want to live that way. Obviously, you know that I know that it's um, you know yeah. the question of whether it's a supply problem or a demand problem is interesting because where we see there is supply of these resources like a, our one safe haven shelter in our district that has you know a couple of dozen beds, there's far more demand to enter that kind of shelter that can connect folks to addiction and mental health services, uh, then there, it seems like really the problem is supply. Oh, if we get to a certain supply where we have an abundance of those things that we can you know, confront if there isn't enough demand. I mean, I will tell you this, I, I speak at international conferences and 
But what I hear over and over again, and, I, and I've looked at the data myself, is what is it with the U.S. and drugs? Um, <laughs> nobody has the kind of problem we have. Canada is the only high-income co country that comes anywhere near us. Scotland is the next highest in terms of uh, overdose death rate, and Scotland is so small. I mean, nobody comes near where we are. Now, some of it, I think, is an accident of geography right now, since we're right next to Mexico, and we're this rich country right next to Mexico, much poorer country, and it they piggybacked on the opioid crisis. So, uh, but we need to look at our own selves, I think, and... I scratched my head over that one uh, because I don't have an answer to it. And I, I, I do. But. Um, I wanted to ask you, we heard from the Washington Square Park administrator that there is a certain initiative that's going on in Washington Square Park. Is this through your office? No, no, not an outreach initiative. I, I don't know what. There's nothing that we've got going there now. Oh, okay. All right. I take that back. Um, the last one question before yeah, I think she talked about the meeting that we're working with the uh, first deputy commissioner's office from the mayor, um, Danny, our office, uh, where I, it, we just started. It only happened uh, two months ago. Um, so we're, we're having meetings of, uh, concentrating on issues surrounding Washington Square Park. Oh, uh, let me, let me, let, maybe we'll follow up with you about that after this tonight's meeting and we'll see if that's an occasion for another conversation. I may be wrong. I, I, I thought I heard Will Robinson, not Will Robinson, what's his name? Will Morrison. Will Robinson is from uh, a television show. Uh, Will Morrison say that there was uh, an interagency uh, approach going on in Washington Square Park and that it was pretty recent. It is recent. It is recent. Okay. Sheena Wright's office, um, first deputy mayor, okay. uh, her office uh, initiated that. Oh, okay, great. We'll, we'll follow up on that then. The other thing I wanted to ask you goes back to the supply question, I mean, and prosecutions. Our impression is that if you arrest a guy on the street who is selling a small amount of drugs or whatever, a large amount of drugs, but obviously he's getting them from somewhere else, nothing much really happens. I mean, he's supplanted by someone else. Maybe he goes in, he comes out. But there's a concern that the actual enforcement of all this stuff isn't actually that effective. Well, I mean, what you, your aim is oftentimes is disruption. You, you know, you disrupt, you disrupt, you disrupt. Somebody goes away. They don't want to... They lose awesome. the product every time they're disrupted. They, it, if they think they're actually going to face a consequence by about the fourth or fifth time they're arrested for selling drugs, they actually are going to face a consequence. Um, and so, and what you don't want to do is normalize selling drugs, right? So, but I, I do think that in terms of drug organizations, even the street sale organizations, if if the goal is to disrupt. You're, you're not going to declare victory, put up your flag and declare victory. It's, it takes a long time to do that, particularly given the crisis that we've got going on now. Um, but, you know, so you take it back, and, and we did this in the crack era too, you take back parts of the city kind of inch by inch, row by row, block by block, uh, and and then all of a sudden, it's a brighter day. And then you put two of them back to back, and you've got a brighter neighborhood. You know, so if you're in it, you're in it for the long haul. That's the way I've always looked at it. Just before I get to Zach, in the whole five boroughs, what are four hot spots of drugs? I mean, I'm going to guess that what we think is really big drug activity in Washington Square Park is not actually a real big drug activity in the context of the entire city. Um, I mean, the worst <laughs> kind of drug markets are probably up in the Bronx, uh, but the 25th precinct in Manhattan is pretty bad. And there are areas in the 9th that are very bad and we've got a lot of violence associated with them. Um, and so the highest rates of overdose deaths by far in the Bronx, they've got of the top 10 districts, I think they've got about seven 
Um, and so certainly there are places that are worse, but if you're living in your neighborhood and you are afraid to come home at night because you're afraid somebody's going to be strung out on your stew, it doesn't make any difference if somebody's maybe worse off than you. It feels pretty bad. And I, I understand that. I think we all understand that. I hate to tell you this, but I, I thought that I was only going to be on until 7.30 and I'm going to have to leave pretty soon. Oh, well, we won't keep you, but Zach had another question. And uh, can we keep you for seven more minutes? Sure, of course you can. Okay. We can, we can. It's ahead. a very quick question, but just, you know, in, in thinking about disrupting um, these supply chains, of course, people in the community are witnessing these drug deals very often. What are things that, that they can do, that they can report to the police, the 311, to try and continue to disrupt this flow as you were just talking about, Bridget? Well, I, I mean, I think they ought to continue to report because that's what gets, you know, it's the squeaky wheel that gets the oil. And it's the same is true when it comes to this kind of enforcement. If you get, and you guys are doing a good job of making noise, I must say. You, you know, I, I hear your I hear your problems. I'm trying to figure out where are your hot spots and what can we do about it. So um and that's what gets that's what gets the, the wheels moving. Let me just see. Let me just before I go to Ryder, is there anyone on the Zoom or in the room who would like to ask a question from the public raise your hand? No? Okay, Ryder. Okay, I have two two final questions. One is, um, you mentioned scaffolding in passing, and I, you know, thinking about the kinds of things we can advocate for again, you know, is the, and what makes America distinct, or what makes New York distinct? Certainly something to think about New York is the prevalence of our scaffolding and how long it stays up. Are there things we can be advocating for, like reforms to local law 11, <laughs> or other, you know, improvements to subway stations that are blighted, that you think would be correlated with a reduction in drug activity around the city? Well, I think you're absolutely right about the scaffolding. I mean, drug dealers want to be <laughs> co covert, you know? So you want more lights, you want, um, you know, you want the scaffolding down. Yeah. Things just more out in the open. I, I think that's a great point. If you can accomplish that, the better off you're gonna be. About the scaffolding, not about local law. Well, I mean, <laughs> I don't know about local law, I'm not I'm keen to let you go. I'm keen. Does anyone have any other questions? I have one. Yes. My final Bye. question is a, is a big picture one, which is about uh, connected to overdose prevention centers, which are a hot topic here. I, I actually <laughs> was talking recently to someone who was uh, formerly prosecuted narcotics uh, crimes and is a fan of overdose pre prevention centers and said that an issue is that right now there are these vicious circles where the harm reduction is clustered. So like a methadone clinic and an OPC are right next to each other and they're often in vulnerable communities that have high rates of activity and that then there's a, a perception that they draw crime or draw drug use and that you know his thought was the solution to that is a lot more things like a lot more OPCs and a lot more neighborhoods that are not specifically vulnerable and that if there were harm reduction uh, supply available across the city and not just in highly vulnerable uh, districts, that that could show or you know reduce those vicious circles. Um, and I, I, I can tell that I think you're skeptical of that, but I'm curious what you think. Well, I, there's, at, there's really no, no research that supports uh, supervised injection site reducing overdose deaths. Go, you know, if you look at the stats on Vancouver, which is where they started in North America, the overdose rates there have escalated and as they put up more supervised injection sites. There's absolutely no support. Exchanges. Let me just shift to another area, which is they're not legal. And if you see the places in the country that are looking at going forward with them, it's Rhode Island and Massachusetts might be, but Rhode Island, at the state legislature passed a law outlining a structure form, even though they're illegal under, under federal law. 
uh, and it puts it under the state health department and it requires community consent. So if so, I think if we're going to move forward with this thing, these there is no you know the supervised injection sites are not under anybody's supervision. They're not under the city health department. They're not under the state health department. They're not answerable to anybody. And, and so you don't want that kind of a structure for places, it, for any entity, Not certainly not one where people are kind of risking their lives every time they go in there. Um, and so if it's gonna move forward, it's not about blanketing the area with them before we develop a structure that is a that makes sense. And I think the place to look for that, the I've looked at, um, I forget who else, I, I think Rhode Island is the only one that actually passed a statute and they, they're starting one, um, it, it, but they've selected the site and the site itself is in a relatively isolated area and it has all kinds of other services. It, you know, it, the, these sites, yeah, maybe there are social worker inside and whatever, but it's not like a, there's a clinic and there's all kinds of other uh, supports available. And it should not be a standalone. It shouldn't just be you go in and use drugs. I mean, people who are accessing that have a problem. Many, most of them do. And so you wanna have other, you wanna have clinics on sites. And in Rhode Island, in order to access it and, and access other services, you've got to go through counseling and treatment. So it's so it's a whole package of supports for people who are suffering with an issue. Now that kind of thing I could get behind, but but just a standalone structure that's not under any entity, it, it just does honestly, and the and the fallout for the neighborhood, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um so. But, I, I, you know, look, there are other models in other places um, that I think make a whole lot more sense than that one. And thank that, you so much. That is, that is wonderful fodder for a possible next conversation, follow-up conversation. So I'll have two okay. conversations with Cal because we'd be very interested in hearing the kinds of models that you think are successful uh, or that are have potential for success. Um, I want to, th oh, Carter Booth has a question. A member of our board has a question. Uh, yeah, I can promote. Carter, why don't you go ahead? Oh, uh, yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, I was getting a few messages uh, from, from Zoom. I, I wanted to thank both of you guys for coming. I know, Calvin, you, you, you regularly attend a lot of the community council precinct meetings. And um, I was just wondering, uh, and, and also I know that you've been getting a lot of outreach from the Block Association oh, within CB2. Um, you specifically the the uh, McDougal West Fourth Sixth Street Block Association. I don't know if if Suzanne, if you've shared any of the emails that the board gets from them, um, but they've really have been doing a lot of outreach with respect to the on the ground conditions. Um, you know, they supply a lot of photographs of 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 what's actually happening every day uh, in our community. How do you guys respond? to the that input because i think that's the type of input that you know people are frustrated and that's they're trying to show it with the pictures they have videos of what's happening and they're very frustrated that not a lot is happening I, I, my personal sense is i get the precinct is also a little frustrated and that they are performing their roles as well and then uh as you guys have said a lot of people aren't accepting treatment Right, so we have this little cycle and this little circle in the middle in New York City that, in the last couple of years, seems relatively unaddressed, and it's that circle is growing and growing, and that has to do with a lot of the changes in the laws, et cetera. I think the Council Member Botcher's initiative is sort of a step in this, but what do you guys suggest? You know, what 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 can actually be done because your graph showed this problem is growing. People are sharing the problem yep. and a lot of the work seems successful on paper, but we see a different result on the streets, you know, and, and just what's Thank happening. You, Carter. Thank you, Carter. 
Bridget, do you want to respond? Uh, well, I, I mean, as I say, I, I think we need a much more robust treatment response. And I do think that we may have to uh, be more, um, I, I mean, back when we started offering treatment as opposed to incarceration, um, we had a lot of success with it. And a lot of people don't like that model, but we may have to do something along those lines because we just uh, are, people don't respond to just uh, offering them the option of treatment. Right. Um, and, and they are committing uh, crimes. And I don't just mean drug possession crimes. There's a lot of other crimes associated with it. So we have to think about how to get more people in treatment. Um, that would be my number one. And the second is getting out of prevention message. I think that's partly why the answer to what I always get asked, what is it in the US? I think the US maybe has, um, people have unrealistic expectations or they don't know enough, I don't know. But I do think we have to focus on those two areas. Thank you so much. It's 7.45. I, and my I had one follow-up, Susanna. I'm really going to have to go. Yeah, she has to. But Bridget has okay. to. Well, I, I, it's all right. I can share the question after she's Absolutely. Gone. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Uh, Bridget. I'm so Howard. sorry. I, I really thought it was only till 7.30. No, that's quite well, all right. Thank you, for the, well, thank you for the time you've given us. We know that your schedule is pretty pleasure. demanding. Okay, thank you. Thank Good luck, you everybody. So thank, thank you, Calvin. So thank we're you. Now. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. 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 Uh, we're gonna go into business session. Uh, Susanna, I just wanted to Calvin, follow up on what I- Yeah, you may. Uh, did you wanna to talk to Calvin or do you wanna to talk to uh, us? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I Calvin, if, if he's still- Oh, on, I don't know, they're all gone. They have okay, because I'm just gonna say most of our service providers, I mean, this topic oh, is covered right? every month at the local oh. precinct meetings. Um, yeah. Pretty regularly. And what what we hear is everybody knows everybody by name. Most of the recidivist, unfortunately, the street users that we see, you see them, you know, they, they have the, the Narcan bags from New York City Health or clipped to them often from their visits. You, you see the engagement is happening. We hear that the engagement is happening when they come to us. Uh oh, now we don't hear them at all. I think you just stopped talking. Can you guys hear me? Or is the... yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I was just saying most, you know, what we hear at the precinct meetings, everybody knows every all the street users on a first name basis. That's a pretty normal. And many of them have the the New York City health kits clipped to them. When you walk by, you can tell that the, the outreach has been happening. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that there's no incentive or, or I, I mean from the user perspective they keep coming back they they continue to use and that's and many of them that's life. From that's what we've life. heard are also housed they come here to visit during the day and and you know many of the shelters for single men particularly are up in the bronx that are available for them so that they go up there and they come back it seems like the conversation doesn't ever progress beyond that point. And, and that's really the, the crux, it would seem to me of, and that's why I really like Eric's bill is that, that it's a first step in addressing this little circle of emptiness. And it, that circle of emptiness seems to have occurred in the last three or four years and you contribute to whatever it is, but it's the reality for a lot of our community. I mean, there are over a hundred people who attend the precinct community council meetings about this issue. You know, mm -hmm. they're not here at this meeting, but this is a, the, the advocacy and you heard the acknowledgement, you know, that they're getting the attention, the precinct is doing this, but there's just the level of frustration. Yeah. That, and, and I just don't know, it seems that nobody's taking that next step of, you know, we talk to everybody, but how do we get action on yeah. that next step. And and that's really the big hole. I, I mean, Susanna, does, does Mark forward to you 
some of these emails from the community members? I mean, I, you know, we know this has been a hot issue for a long time. Yeah. And I mean, you know, they're, I, they're doing monthly so, updates with just photographs from all over the community. Yeah, and yeah, it reflects I've, what each of us may see on occasion when we walk, but the, the, it really captures a larger picture of what the experience is across, particularly, you know, particularly around Washington Square Park. Yeah, and it's well, pretty astounding, gonna, I, the, the change. I don't, I don't know if you were here at the beginning of the meeting, um, but we're going to try to share the slides that they shared with us about uh, maps of drug sales and 20, 2023 over 2024 and stuff. So we'll put all that. I mean, yes, it's a very frustrating situation. I heard frustration from her as well. Right? Yeah. I mean, I'm the so, nature of the beast. And I don't even need to listen to the emails because I see them shooting up myself. It's hard. Um, okay, so now we're in business session. A couple of things I wanted to talk about. Uh, first of all, do we want to write a resolution about this? And if so, what would we say? Well, who would it be targeted to? Um, I don't know. That's another. I mean, I mean, the, the mayor or the state or the, I mean, I actually want to discuss with Janine, maybe, or not Janine, um, uh, Patricia, whether we want to do a, a joint resolution to schools or schools for the um, outreach for the education component? Um, well, with schools, I mean, we really haven't talked about schools in this meeting. We don't have anyone from schools. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know that that would make sense to do with their. Well, I'm on the school committee. Right. But in other ready. words, we haven't had anyone. I mean, it's, this is, there's no one from schools at this meeting. She's talking, she about, yeah. she's, she's talking about education, but I think when yeah. she talks about prevention, she's not just talking about children. She's talking about adults and, and right? I mean, is that fair to say? She's talking about both, but the, what she emphasized as a constructed step was to do outreach to younger people um, just on the impact and information about yeah. that substance. I don't yeah, think, I, I think there's something I mean, that we can I do was ourselves. struck by the pills looking like oh, the fentanyl, right. but but that is used in high schools. Those pills, right. um, and by high school, I mean I can easily picture high school kids. Oh, like, absolutely. Here, I'm this. Just, so yeah, I'm this. this what, what she's saying is not a bad idea. I don't think it's necessarily a resolution, but I think so steps or something. Perhaps that person should be sedated. Uh, yes. <laughs> I think the I think the notes in of themselves and I mean this can be a report or this can be a resolution. I think a, 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 a report. A report makes more sense because I think part of the our objective in this when we talked about it a few months ago was like let's do a little truth telling in terms of what is the current situation and I think a lot of the information that she shared of you know there's been an uptick this One year. One thing that I would like to point out, however is that if you look at the arrest report from the 6th precinct, and then if you look at above um, 14th Street, you'll see a lot more arrests above 14th Street than you will see below 14th Street in the Meatpacking District. One of the things I just would like to point out is that there's probably much more drug taking within the Meatpacking District than there is in the projects just north. And that there should be some, you know, some sort of equitable policing. Uh, I think there's two things, right? One is possession and the other misdemeanor possession and the other is sales, right? So, well, I mean, a guy or for both locations. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I feel like we don't have enough information to really make that. I looked at the arrest um, uh, for the sixth precinct and I'm north of 14th Street. So I don't have that data with me right now. But that's easily garnered, and that is that's why I was asking her about the arrests or the overdoses in the meatpacking, because that wasn't represented on the map. And it, it, you know, if we were to look not just at the six, but just you know across the border where there is a large project right. on Fourteenth Street, you see a lot more going on over there than you do you know a block or two. And this is just about equity, and it's about equitable policing. So uh, I think Something that that would be a, 
Yeah, I think that that would be a conversation with the precinct. Yes, absolutely. She's not made there. This office is no, not absolutely arrest. So it's something yeah. a question mark for the future. Does everyone feel that it makes more sense to do a report than a resolution? Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. Fine. Um, so that's what we'll do. Uh, I wanted to raise also a broader topic that has nothing to do with this. That has to do with succession and term limits on the community boards. So as you know. Uh, the city has changed the rules about community boards, and now we have five term, five terms, and then we're out, right? What are you saying? Four, Four terms, and then we're out. Right. Okay, anyway, whatever. My last year is 2027. I have one more term, uh, right? You joined after me? I, I don't remember when I joined, but I, whatever. Mm -hmm. 2018 is the year that it started, right? I think it's 2019, yeah. yeah Everything I'm before out, the clock started. I'm out by 2027. That's oh, okay. I'm out by 2027, right? So, so I think, I mean, I think that this committee is not the one where succession is the most important. I think there are committees where it's really important. But I do think all I can I think writers should take over as vice chair. All I can do is control this. So this is what I want. Are you vice chair now? What I want to read to Mr. Vice Chair. So here's what I want my thinking about this. My thinking about a succession plan, and I'd like to hear your feelings about it, and, and then we'll talk about it. Um, I thought if my, so 25 begins my last term, presuming I'm still chair and I still want to be on the community board, which I do, um, it's time for me to pass the torch to somebody else. And I also think that in the last year that I serve, and I think this should be true of everyone on the board, but I'm just speaking about me, uh, I should no longer be chair. There should at least be at least one year where someone else is the chair and I'm still on the committee and I'm still on the board and I can still contribute, but I'm not the chair. And so the question becomes, and, and there are some people from our committee missing, but is there anyone who is interested, who, who expects to be here, and of course life changes, but for now, who's in this for the long haul until the end of their terms, who's interested in becoming a vice chair, you are the vice chair, and it sounds like you would rather not be the vice chair. I, I would be happy. I would be happy to be the vice chair. Yeah. I, my clock starts, I think, at the very beginning of 2022. So I'll be turned out well after you. Okay. And I certainly, as long as I'm on the board, will want to be on this committee. Okay. And of course, it, I mean, we're not anointing writer. If you're interested, if that's something that interests you and that's something that interests Emma and Ivy's not here and you're not interested, are you? I'm going to be turned out. So okay, you know, that's okay. what I'm considering. But are you turned out? But no one will be turned out before 2027. No, 2027 is kind of down. So I'm thinking backwards, right? By yeah, yeah. So I don't think this is an urgent for 2026. Yes. It's for 2025, because by 2025, yeah, yeah, I, see. I, I want to have a vice chair in place I see. who is going to become the chair, I see. right? Barring any, you know, yeah. malfeasance or whatever. You know, <laughs> totally. <it's>, and <laughs> I, I think, and, and I think that there should be misdemeanor arrests. There should be one year where I'm a chair, but the vice chair, and I'm not doing all the reports. I'm getting a lot of sharing yeah. from other people and then a year when i am not the chair right. i think not only is that a good idea for this committee but i think this is the kind of conversation to raise up exact i have tried something the whole yeah. board should do yeah. via a working group to make a term limit plan and something that would apply to every committee i have been trying to push that on the and actually i raised this idea with susan and i mean Mark, yeah. it's like a lot of thinking to do. I mean, I, I personally, I think it's critical for SLA and land use. I mean, totally. and yeah. institutional memory, you know, yeah. building it up. And yeah, and also the way we do things. And, you know, anyway, so, but for this committee, which is the, you know, that's my purview. So if, if you're interested in becoming, I'll raise this with Emma as well. And then we'll just determine the succession plan. Great. And we'll put it in action in 2025. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, good. In that case, I think we're done. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Anything else? Well, I mean, I think that we can sing about schools. I mean, I think you should, somebody, we should, uh, education is pretty crucial. I wonder the demographics of the arrests and um, the buyers in, around Washington Square Park. All is, that, is that data, that, is, I don't know how to get that data, that. but that data. Yeah, yeah, I'm just curious, are these people coming from, the boroughs, are they tourists or 
NYU students. Sales or use? Sales. Sales is what I care about. I mean, personally. Well, who's buying stuff? Who's exactly. Buying That's a good question. You know? Who's buying yeah. It? Well, yeah. Not who's necessarily that? supplying it. I, I'm just, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, about the yeah, tourist who's buying high it. doesn't worry me so much as a junkie who is has a miserable life. But that, that could be a, I could, well, I mean, a junkie will be, could be somebody from the outer boroughs. It could be, yes, absolutely. Right. It could be an NYU student. It could be somebody that lives locally. And so I'm just curious as to who are those people that are quote unquote, the junkies. I mean, I would, uh, I think cause Washington Square Park it is so visible. Like it's also a little easy to see that. It, I, I think most of, like, most of them are unhomed, success, right? Yeah, like most of them unhomed. I, and I'm just shocked that we don't have numbers on Christopher's, for example, where it's, yeah. you know, endemic over there. It, it, well, we should I, talk about how we can get them. I mean, look, we, we just, this conversation was about, you know, well, she taught us a lot. Of, she taught us a lot, she right? Did. She, did. she really did teach us a lot. And I also fantastic get by the way. Yeah. Uh, you're yes. Well, thank you. I just whatever. I just asked. And but um, but I we learned a lot, and I also felt like I was in good hands. I felt like I don't know who you all felt, but I thought this is a really intelligent person who's got the right feelings and all of that. So I felt in good hands. However, there are lots of other ways to get to this issue, and we could be talking about what. Yeah, I actually. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. A question about that is like, do we have an agenda for our meetings over the next few months or the rest of the year? Because I think if this is the most kind of urgent and relevant issue to the committee vis the district, I do think more perspectives would be good. Would okay. Be good. So let's talk about the year. Um, so August, no meeting. So in October, we have to give our year long priorities, right? So I would like the September meeting, barring any other thing. I'd like us in September, and I'll give you materials to prepare for it. I'd like us to identify our priorities. And I'd like to pass resolutions on them because I think it might be helpful for the board to have an official stand on these agencies or services or whatever they are, right? Greenwich House and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I want to just be on the record for that. Um, so that's September. Now, I don't, most of our agenda, as you all know, is up to us. I know that. St. Luke's is going to have to come back, and I don't know if they'll come back in October, um, but they're going to come back at some point to talk about that. We don't have to have just one item on our agenda, so I think starting in October, we can do anything we want. Well, I, do I mean, it would be super nice to have somebody from the 6th Precinct. I know that's really, 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 really hard. Well, it's not. I don't know that it's really, really, really hard. Um, I, when, when I thought that safety was part of the purview of this committee, which then I was told it isn't, I talked to all four of the precincts, yeah, four precincts, and it's a little tricky because, uh, well, they have their own meetings, right? So they have to go to those. And also it's point in time, right? They, they come to us and it's one, you know, they can't tell it's not what happened. It's happening tomorrow. It's not, they can't, they can talk about recent trends, but it's just like what's happening point in time. So there was only so much, there wasn't so much utility to having them come to us once a year because once a year doesn't tell us that much. However, if we have a more specific question about this scene. About this topic, yeah. I think it could shed a lot of light. Yeah, I think that what we would wanna do is have a sense of what we're trying to get out of this meeting and, and, and do it that way. The other thing is that there is this initiative going on in Washington Square Park, this thing that he yeah, I was curious by, and I think we that. need to find out more about that. Maybe that's what we focus on first. Yeah, well, that's a good start. Yeah. What about the subway station at Houston and Broadway? It looked like there was a cluster of arrests there as well. And West and 4th Street. That's the ninth that's that's nice also one on Broadway. Yeah. One by Broadway. There's just I think that's there's nine always stuff. Well, there's also a methadone clinic on Mercer Street. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think we've heard. Yeah, what were you saying? Mercer I was just gonna say, like, I think if we're thinking about uh things like the Washington Square Initiative, to me that also brings to mind the herd, the program, the like policing augmentation with services program that thought wants. Workers. I wonder if like if it's something that we could advocate, oh, if we could, you know, augment 
That's have a great idea. idea. So, so like having that. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, yeah. we, I think there's a lot of controversy over beaker. There is. Is effective or not effective. Yeah, there was a lot of controversy. Also, this is just about adding social workers to police calls. Yes. Yeah, they, and it's, <laughs> yes, they it's, it's com we, we looked at it when we did that whole thing on, on mental, serious mental illness. That was one of the programs. The other one that we should revisit, and I'm saying pointing at you only because yeah. you said maybe that's something. Yeah, yeah. Is we really push for intensive level treatment programs, IMTs? Yeah. They've taken that out, right? and then funded no, that. I'm just wrote a piece about how it's not. There's not enough data to, yeah. to support. There's not enough data about it. Like it's not. It's not a slam dunk. We don't really know. So that might be something that we investigate further. And we heard we should. I mean, these are all things that are, they treat not just substance use, and they certainly don't treat drug sales. Right, right. But they treat- And we may treat substance use alone, it's pretty useless. What? Treating substance, I mean, you don't treat, substance use comes from your living area. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, when they offer drug treatment alternatives to prison, this is something that this organization cases does to you. But they offer if you're if you're going to go to jail, you get this passing. But if you do this, you won't have to, right? If you go for yeah, treatment right. for your That's mental illness right. or you go for treatment for drugs, and she seemed to find promise in that too. She's, yeah, she's not like a sense. Another, I was going to say another topic that we could explore that would be interesting for our community now is with the closure of Beth Israel. Oh, yes, <laughs> we won't have an ED that's there on 15th Street. Well, actually, yes, although that's going to be a yes. No, no, I know, I know. I just was thinking about the fact that now Mount Sinai has to pay to expand, which they were going to do anyways. They've are, that's already within their closure plan. You know, the, I don't know exactly how much. Um, I'll try to find out right. some information about So wait, that. let's let's try to stick to this because we're, we're talking about some things that can actually become part of each other. So one is the Washington Square Park Initiative. The other is Be Heard and IMT, right? Okay, and then down the road, we're talking about, we should at some point talk, so I would just, we should talk to Bellevue about and I was going to say, it's it, it's not just about emergency services. It's specifically with respect to overdoses and emergency treatment. Where do they go now? Right. Well, also because Beth Israel was an emergency psych department and the only one, and NYU is not the only one that is, is Bellevue. It would be great to have Bellevue come in at some point. Ha! See if they'll do that. So if you give me a date, I can get somebody. Okay. All right. Figure out a date that we like that. Good idea. Like that idea. idea. Yeah, sure. you don't even know what we're talking about. Yeah, I'm vaguely. Right. Yeah. Okay, so Beth is yeah. closing. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> Have you heard? We've not been asleep for six months. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Okay. I took someone to the emergency room at Beth Israel a few weeks ago. Oh yeah. It was a great experience because the staff was so pissed off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were great to us. I brought in a woman. You know, from Uganda with no insurance, no money. They said, it doesn't matter. Yeah. They don't have our address. They're never going to get the money anyway. And they did everything they could. They were so spectacular. That was great. Right. Guys, thanks everyone for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark, I'm leaving this here. All oh, right. I didn't, you don't see it. Thanks, everybody.